OK, now we're into the depression year of Australian politics, in which we'll cover the four Prime Ministers who led us in the build-up to World War II, starting with James Scullin. Now just before we begin, I want to quickly thank my patrons for supporting this channel. Thomas Johnson, James Rapp, John Mezzo, Mike Rann, Cameron Strauss, Rudbot, Tom Smarty, Edward Pierre, Lachlan Good, Matt435, Anyhow Hence, Jezza, and a special mention to ARW for his contribution to today's video. For as little as three Australian dollars a month, you can get your name shouted out at the start of every Sawman video, as well as access to bonus behind the scenes content, link in the description below. ARW says, It's impossible to read about James Scullin's two years as Prime Minister without feeling pity for the man, as no Prime Minister before or since has governed in circumstances as difficult as those he encountered. After achieving a stunning electoral victory over Bruce's government in 1929 and bringing Labour back into power for the first time since the split of 1916, Scullin was immediately confronted with the onset of the Great Depression. Despite taking the crisis seriously and mustering his political skills to confront it, he was unable to keep the party united, and his government would ultimately disintegrate by the end of 1931. The government was initially split on whether to respond with interventionist measures or to earn on the side of an economic orthodoxy and implement austerity measures. And it was amidst this schism that Labour frontbenchers Joseph Lyons, who favoured austerity, would leave the party to join the opposition. Scullin would ultimately pursue an orthodox response through the Premier's plan in mid-1931, as stiff opposition from the Senate, business groups and the financial sector made more interventionist responses unachievable. The Premier's plan was unpopular among Labour's grassroots, a situation that was exploited by the renegade New South Wales Premier Jack Lang, who openly reputed the Scullin government by advocating his own unorthodox suite of measures. The Scullin government made its demand when the supporters of Lang in the Federal Labour Party split from the party and forced Scullin to an election in late 1931, at which Labour suffered a severe loss against the opposition United Australia Party, headed by the aforementioned defector Joseph Lyons. Scullin would remain in Parliament right through the Depression in more years and would act as a key mentor to Prime Ministers Curtin and Chifley in the 1940s, though he quite understandably never served as an official position of any government ever again. Despite his lack of luck in government, Scullin would remain loyal to the Labour Party right to the end of his life, and on the character grounds, he suddenly emerges as a stronger figure than those who contributed to his government's downfall. Mitchell Nolan says, James Scullin is a victim of Labour infighting and bitchy liberals in the Senate. Often gets blamed for the Premier's plan, but I don't see any alternative that he could have got past the Senate with the Conservatives refusing to work productively, even during a depression. I would compliment his character seeing how he wouldn't cut pensions for that Gimson credit. In hindsight though, he probably should have called a double dissolution. I don't know what he's going to do with seven senators. And finally we have me. To me, Scullin is arguably the most underrated Prime Minister ever. He was one who steered us through the Great Depression, while his successor Joseph Lyons got all the credit for riding the inevitable economic rise that follows any depression. I wish we could have seen more of Scullin outside of the Depression, as I feel like he could have been a really great Prime Minister. And now, let's talk about Lyons. ARW says Joseph Lyons was elected to the Federal Parliament in 1929 after two decades of experience in the Tasmanian Parliament, including a stint as Premier of Tasmania in the mid-1920s. Lyons' experiences in Tasmania instilled him a more conservative approach to politics than what was commonplace among the broader Labour Party, and when he began to question the directions of the Scullin government in the 1930s, he was courted by key business figures to abandon Labour and become leader of the new United Australia Party. He would go on to lead the United Australia Party to a landslide win in 1931 and would remain in power right up to his death in 1939. Lyons proceeded to implement austere economic measurements in line with prevailing economic theories at the time. Australia would recover from the depression by the mid-1930s, though to what extent Lyons' government should be credited for this remains a matter of debate. The most notable feature of Lyons' time as Prime Minister was his then innovative use of communications to reject his easygoing style of leadership to the Australian people. He was the first Prime Minister to use the radio extensively, the ABC having come into existence in 1932. He was the first Prime Minister to travel extensively by aeroplane, and he notably used his natural Australian accent in newsreels at a time when most Australian public officials put on fake British accents when speaking in public. Lyons' style of leadership required adjustment in the late 1930s, when war became increasingly likely due to the aggressive actions of Hitler's Germany and Imperial Japan. Doubts about Lyons' ability to respond to these threats grew inside the UAP, The Lyons would ultimately die in office just mere months before war broke out. These tumultuous events that would follow would largely overshadow Lyons' overall legacy as Prime Minister. 
We also have someone 234 who says, It's no coincidence that we recovered from the Great Depression under Lyons, but also thanks to Lyons that he's the reason we never had a qualified cabinet with former premiers and state ministers, which on paper creates an experienced government. And finally we have me. While Lyons seems like a pretty nice guy to have as Prime Minister, I can't get past the fact that he was a Labour rat who undermined his own party to seize power. As I said in my previous monologue, I feel like he got all the credit for Scullin's hard work putting Australia back on the road to recovery, and that's what carried him through two re-elections in 1934 and 1937. However, even if I have issues with him, I cannot overlook the fact that he modernised the role of Prime Minister. Creating the ABC then using the ABC to talk to the people really brought the government closer to the voting public and helped turn Lyons into one of the most beloved Prime Ministers. And now for a completely different character in Elle Page. ARW says, Earl Page is essentially the template for each successive leader of the country now National Party has followed. After winning the crossbench in the 1922 election, Page was able to negotiate a strong position for himself in the country party, becoming the treasurer and unofficial deputy prime minister of the Nationals Country Coalition government under Stanley Bruce. Page would similarly play a key role in the UAP Country Coalition governments under Joseph Lyons, and when Lyons died in April 1939, Page was selected to serve as interim prime minister by the governor general while the UAP selected his replacement. Page's brief time as Prime Minister should have been uneventful, but Page was on a figure to go about things quietly. Page had a long distrust and dislike the UAP's eventual choice as Prime Minister, Robert Menzies. And before Menzies was sworn as Prime Minister, Page made a highly defamatory speech against him on the floor of Parliament, questioning Menzies' loyalty to Lyons and claiming that Menzies was unfit to be a wartime leader due to his decision not, not to serve in the First World War. The fallout from Page's attacks on Menzies saw Page's two decades stint as country leader come to an end, and every end of the coalition between the UAP and country party. The country party would eventually settle under a new leadership and Page would go into service as health minister in the second Menzies government. How the two could even sit in the same room after the events of April, April 1939 is one of Australia's greatest political mysteries. Nonetheless, Page's attacks on Menzies remains one of the greatest acts of political bastardy in the history of Australian politics, and the Nationals Party's modern reputation of producing mavericks is no doubt traces back to Page's time as leader. And we also have me. Perhaps it's my disgust at the modern Nationals Party, but I can't really stand Page. He always seemed to be a man of extreme ambition, as seen with his quite frankly unreasonable demands to have almost half of the National Cabinet be Country Party members, despite the Country Party nowhere near making up half the coalition. While his fans probably like the fact that he punched above his weight, I just find him very arrogant, which is a trait I often attribute to modern Nationals MPs. And finally, let's talk about Arthur Fadden. ARW says, Arthur Fadden became leader of the country party in late 1940s in the aftermath of the 1940 election, which resulted in a hung parliament. By this time, the UAP Country Coalition was reconstituted under Page's successor as leader, RJ Cameron. The Cameron soon fell out with a favour as the country party leader, and Fadden was selected to become the country leader as well as Deputy Prime Minister under Menzies. When Menzies resigned in late 1941, Fadden became Prime Minister due to the UAP's inability to select a convincing replacement. Fadden was able to maintain the coalition government until the independents that had been key in keeping the government alive decided to switch support to John Curtin's Labour Party in October 1941, when they rejected Fadden government's budget. Fadden would lead the opposition into the 1943 election, at which the coalition would suffer a devastating loss. In the aftermath of this result, Menzies would claim the UAP leadership and would reconfigure the party as the Liberal Party of Australia. Fadden continued the coalition with Menzies' new party, and upon Menzies' victory in 1949, Fadden would serve as treasurer until his retirement in 1958. By then, the country party's long-term position within the coalition was secured, and Fadden's successes as country nationals leaders have largely followed his example of ensuring the coalition between the federal, liberal and national parties survives to this very day. And we also have me. I don't have much to say about Fadden. I guess as I could say good on for him that he went from being a compromised pick for country party leader to a full on prime minister, and for the fact that he remained leader of the country party well into the 50s. I definitely found him more tolerable than Page, which I also guess is another plus. Either way, let's wrap things up. Well, we are now done with the Depression era. Next time we look at Labour's wartime government with John Curtin, Frank Ford and Ben Chifley. Once again, please comment your opinions on these three figures here or on Patreon if you want to see them featured in the next video. And until then, I'll see you later.